Hello, it's the 19th of July, it's the sixth Sunday after Trinity and uh, we continue with our time of prayer and worship online. This Sunday will be the third Sunday that we have actually been uh, able to gather in the church, those who feel able uh, to do that. Uh, and uh, I've lost track of how many Sundays we've been doing online worship and that will continue for the foreseeable future um, while things are still up in the air in the way that they are. Uh, you should be able to find, as, I, as was the case last week, um, a link in the YouTube and the Facebook descriptions that will take you through to um, a version of the order of service that will be using. So you can join in uh, with the service if you wish and follow along with the readings. Uh, and if you're doing that, uh, as you're following along, just join in with any words that are in bold. So as we prepare to worship today, let's just pause for a moment and gather ourselves uh, for our time with the Lord. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song will we praise our God. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you now and forever. Amen. Our psalm for today is Psalm 139, verses 1 to 11 and 23 and 24. O Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You mark out my journeys and my resting place, and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but you, O Lord, know it all together. You encompass me behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go then from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I make the grave my bed, you are there also. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me and the light around me turn to night. Even darkness is no darkness with you. The night is as clear as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. Search me out, O God, and know my heart. Try me and examine my thoughts. See if there is any way of wickedness in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. 
Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading comes from Genesis chapter 28, beginning at verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring will be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head, and set it up for a pillar, and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We respond to that reading with the canticle Jubilate, which is Psalm 100. O be joyful in the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is gracious. His steadfast love is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. Our New Testament reading comes from Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 12. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labour pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our response is the canticle, Great and Wonderful, taken from Revelation chapter 15. Great and wonderful are your deeds, Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O ruler of the nations. Who shall not revere and praise your name, O Lord, for you alone are holy? 
all nations shall come and worship in your presence, for your just dealings have been revealed. To the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honour and glory and might for ever and ever. Amen. As we continue on through uh, St Paul's letters to the Romans, two weeks ago at the end of chapter 7 we heard the kind of the bad news of how uh, we can't save ourselves, that actually we live in a, a broken world, a, a fractured reality, and our own lives are equally broken and fractured. Uh, there's no controversy there, I don't think. Uh, look at the world as it is right now. Uh, look at your own life. I look at my own life and know that this is true. And then in the beginning of uh, Romans chapter 8, which we looked at last week, we hear that the good news is, yes, there's nothing we can do about it, but there is nothing that we need to do about it because God has done all that is necessary. And while we continue to live in a world and indeed a, a universe, a whole cosmos, uh, that as we hear here later on in Romans chapter 8, uh, is groaning, uh, waiting with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. Uh, and uh, groaning to be set free from bondage and so on. Well, we continue to live in that universe and have lives that sometimes feel like they're filled with groaning, perhaps. Uh, we are told by Paul that because of what Christ has done, because of the perfection uh, revealed in and through Jesus, we are able to live lives that aren't bound to the flesh, you know, to the old order of inevitability and sin and decay and death but actually lives that are bound, as it were, to the spirit, to the realm of the spirit, which is hope and love and goodness and mercy. And here in uh, Romans 8, he continues on with that theme. There's so much could be said. I just want to focus on one little aspect of it. And as I say, this is hardly doing justice to the whole of uh, this, this portion of scripture. And we could go through this sentence by sentence, if not in fact word by word, but we don't have time. But this idea of the spirit of adoption, I think, is so important. I uh, personally have always struggled with the concept of family. Uh, that, for me, becomes is because of uh, my experience of uh, my father dying when I was so very young. Uh, various other issues connected to families I'm not going to go into here uh, of feeling uh, maybe some sense of abandonment. Uh, some sense of disappointment, uh, going through the experience of uh, separation, coming up to divorce, of course, losing my the family that I had acquired through marriage, uh, a big family that overnight I lost entirely. And uh, that's um, an experience that many people go through, uh, sometimes go through experiences far, far worse than that, uh, where family for them is actually a byword for abuse and pain and suffering. But we are told that through Christ, we have been given this spirit of adoption. There are two factors, one from the ancient world and one from the contemporary world, that I just want to, us to take on board as we consider that. In the ancient world, adoption was uh, a thing that happened, but it kind of went a bit further, perhaps, than adoption does today. I'm not saying that that's right or wrong, but when in the ancient world, for instance, we know in the case of emperors of Rome, where an emperor would have adopted someone as his son, even if perhaps he had children already, um, that person became his heir. And it wasn't just like a legal nicety that that, that child and then that man, um, that person became a kind of child. That person was then the son of the emperor they would become the emperor in due course. That adoption wasn't a legal thing. It was a whole, it was kind of overturning uh, the bonds of blood, the bonds of natural relationship. And so adoption, as the people who wrote this, as St Paul would have thought of it, was a far more intrinsic, far more far-reaching concept. It's why, for instance, when we think about Jesus himself, of course, Jesus was adopted. Uh, however you want to understand that story of uh, Mary conceiving Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the son of God. However, Joseph was involved. Uh, even as just his adoptive father, he was truly the son of Joseph. No one would have thought anything more than that. 
Uh, he was the son of Joseph and the son of God and son of Mary, of course. So when in Romans, Paul is talking about this spirit of adoption, I think sometimes we're tricked into thinking that somehow adoption is a kind of a replacement for the real and better thing. But this brings us on to the more contemporary uh, example I want to relate to you. I have a friend uh, who has many children, um, but throughout her life and with her husband, uh, fostered and adopted many, many other children. And I remember speaking to her once. And the way that she talked about it really quite unselfconsciously, fairly typically for, for this person, uh, was that they had children that they'd had naturally, and they had children that they had chosen. The children that came from their own genetic material, shall we say, uh, they had no hand in that, they had no choice in that. They, you know, these were the children that happened. But the children that they had adopted and also the children they'd fostered, were the children that they had chosen. And although there was, yes, a difference there, um, as there is a difference if you have natural children, you see your natural children just differently, but you don't love them any less. They're no less your children, but you've chosen these ones, whatever the circumstances have been. So when we again come to this idea of us being adopted, there's no kind of second best here. What we're being told is that through the Holy Spirit of God, we become children of God. We become co-heirs with Christ. And so, although there will always be some kind of difference between us and Jesus, inevitably, and rightly so, I think there are more points of similarity between us and Jesus than we sometimes remember. Part of that is the responsibility we have to speak of the gospel, to speak of the good news, to speak of healing and hope and restoration and reconciliation. And it's true, we have got so far to go as a church. Um, there are examples, I'm not going to go into them because, again, time. Um, but in the life of the Church of England, even just this week, our complete failure as the church to really, truly and properly model uh, that life of Christ to our own people within the walls of the church, as it were, let alone the people who are called to become part of our community. But as well as responsibility, what the message I want to leave with you, the last thing I want to say to you about this today, is it means that we should be aware that just as Christ is loved eternal, eternally and passionately by his Father, so are we. It's important for us to know that and to remember that and to hold on to that. You and I belong to God in a way that we cannot comprehend. And it's not a second best thing. It's not a kind of religious thing. It's not uh, keeping the score. This goes back to what Paul has said in chapter 7 and chapter the beginning of chapter 8. This isn't about getting it right with God and then somehow we might be allowed, it will be allowed to get off the naughty step and to be in the front room with the Father. We are loved despite our sin, despite everything that could separate us from God and should separate us from God, we are loved so totally and eternally and powerfully by God that as we live our lives, that should be the thing that underpins it all. When, when you get up in the morning, that should be your first thought. That should be the thought and the belief and the joy uh, that accompanies each one of us through our day. Uh, we belong to God. Uh, we can never not belong to God. And it is something that's been given to us as an inalienable right. We've been adopted. He's chosen us. That God has chosen you to be his child. And you can never lose that identity. We proclaim the faith of the church in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of sin saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this point in the service, we are in the church listening to a piece of music because we can't sing. Uh, I'm playing just a piece of music. Uh, I can't do that on here because copyright and all those kind of things. But if you want to pause and listen to that piece of music, if you've got uh, that somewhere in your house or you stream music, uh, we'll be listening to the Contique de Jean Racine by Gabriel Faure. Uh, and the words are in the translation into English. I've put on the order of service so you can actually see what is being sung. It's sung in French. It's a translation of an ancient Latin hymn. Um, but it's a beautiful piece uh, written by Faure when he was at the Ecole Niedermeyer in Paris. when He was 19 years old, which is kind of terrifying. So if you'd like to listen to that, and that's part of the experience, uh, you'd be very welcome to The Contique de Jean Racine by Gabriel Faure. Let us pray. We just bring, pause for a moment and bring our prayers before our Heavenly Father. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gathering our prayers and praises into one. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, establish, strengthen and settle you in the faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you for being part of this time of worship. I hope you are well and uh, staying well and safe and I uh, hope that those of you who are watching this from home um, but would normally be part of the worshipping community at the Church of the Transfiguration hope uh, before too long uh, will be in a place where you feel able to rejoin us in church. It's been lovely to gather but we're very aware of the people who aren't with us and uh, who aren't with us pr in physical form anyway. Uh, so uh, thank you and look forward to joining with you again soon. Thanks very much. <laughs>